Amen. Good morning, my supernatural family. I just want to thank and honor the angel of this house who happens to be my twin, Pastor Maureen and Pastor Rocco. I'd like to honor the leadership of the church, the pastors, Pastor Loazi, Pastor Mkengel, and all the leadership. I'd like to honor my sisters in love. They're no longer sisters in law. Now I'd call them sisters in love. But above all, I want to honor this special man in my life. Uh, sometimes he also gets surprised because we've walked a journey together. We've been together now for 48 years. We've been married for 44 years this year. We've worked as doctors for 40 years. We've had a normal family, then exemplary family, and now we're in the supernatural family, which, I, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And it's all by his grace. It's just grace and grace alone. I was actually quite emotional this morning when I was preparing for this talk, just to think where we come from. We come from a mighty long way, amen. With my husband, as I said, I met him when I was 17 and we've grown together. He's made me to be a wife. He's made me to be a mother. He's made me to be a grandmother. He's taught me how to practice medicine. He's taught me how to look after people as well because he qualified before me. But what also uh, touched me this morning is that, you know, whenever I come to this church, by the way, I've been coming as a visitor. Now I'm a resident visitor. <laughs> whenever I come to this church, I meet so many people and they say, your husband delivered my baby. So we've got so many children. Here, yeah, not only our own children, but God has used those hands to make a lot of you mothers. So I thank God for that. And it doesn't stop to surprise, you know, to marvel actually. I work with him every Thursday. But I always thank God when I see him opening that womb, taking a baby out, hearing that cry of a baby and then the mystery of life. I can never take it for granted. So I am actually very grateful, darling. Thank you, I thank God for you. <clears throat> Want to say happy Mother's Day again. And the privilege of being a mother. As I say, I watch it every week. A mother bringing out life. And the thing that always I'm grateful to God for is that God trusts something so special, the image of God to a woman. Because God is the only species, the woman is the only species that is made with a womb to carry life. And the, the word of God says we are made in his image. So every time we give birth, we are bringing out the image of God in the world. God has trusted us to carry God. He's trusted a woman. You know, there's something. He trusted the womb of a woman. Even when he was going to bring the Savior, the Lord could have done it anyway, but he chose the womb of a woman. So we thank God for that. And our prayer is that, Lord, you've trusted us with life. May we not disappoint you. 
We need your grace to bring these little ones to be who you created them to be. Amen. Amen. So today I'm, go I'm going to be talking about a supernatural family. Talking about a supernatural family, firstly, it will be talking about a supernatural marriage. What is a supernatural marriage? There are four types of marriages. You will diagnose yourself where you belong. <laughs> but at the end of these two services, my prayer is that we will all be a supernatural family because it is by choice. The types of marriages, there's one that's a dysfunctional marriage. There's no order. There's no God. There's chaos. And this is the type that causes a lot of pain in society. And then there are the functional marriages. We've walked the functional marriages with my husband. The normal, the exemplary. Exemplary in what way? It's got desirable characteristics. A man and a woman who love each other, like you've seen. Amen. But also an exemplary marriage has got community impact. When people look at them, they want what they've got. So it's something that is, God is charging us. Let's not have a normal marriage. Let's have not an exemplary marriage, but a supernatural marriage. And I'm going to go a little bit in detail about what a supernatural marriage is. Because a supernatural, supernatural marriage above having desirable characteristics, above community impact, it also has worldwide influence. And it's also got a legacy for God. It's got a heart for the nations. It's got a heart especially for Israel. That's what makes it supernatural. If your family has got love for the nations, love for the family, and a special heart for Israel, then you qualify in a supernatural to have a supernatural marriage. It's not a marriage that is perfect. We are not perfect. In fact, there are no perfect marriages. Even Jesus' family was not perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. Because there were times that the mother and the father couldn't understand what was happening because they were human like us. But he was perfect. And as we embrace him, his lordship, the Holy Spirit, we can convert any marriage. We can convert any family to be a supernatural one. Because the source of the supernatural is God himself. Say so it's not perfect, but it's a marriage of ordinary people with extraordinary grace. They've received grace from the Father. There is a song that I like, which all you know about amazing grace. I especially like the second verse. It says, it was grace that taught my heart to fear. It was grace that relieved my fears. Those who know me, I wouldn't even talk in front of people like this. In fact, my husband, I think, is more surprised because when I had to talk, I had to ask him, says, you talk for me. But grace has made me to be who I am because I've accepted myself, and if there's anything wrong, I belong to God. Amen. It was grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? the hour I first believed. And through many dangers, toils, and snares, we've already come. It was grace that brought us safe thus far, and it will be grace that will lead us home. So the key word is grace. And the supernatural marriage will go through toils. 
It will not be an easy road. It will go to snares. But because of the grace of God and because of the calling of God on your life, you will be able to make it. Amen. I just want, can you just put a supernatural marriage there? Sorry. Supernatural marriage. This is a marriage. A person that is chosen by God, preserved by God. There's supernatural favor. There's supernatural interventions in their lives. It's marriage that are foretold by God through prophetic utterances. Marriage that foretell God's plans and purposes on the earth. Marriage that break barriers and establish new frontiers of relationships. They break barriers. In fact, we've got one here. They don't minister only to their own kind, like Mama Maureen and Papa Rocco. They've broke barriers and they've got a heart for nations. They could have said to God, I want to minister to my own kind. But because they're chosen by God, they belong to this category. Amen. Amen. There are marriages that destroy evil foundations and raise new righteous ones. Like Elizabeth and Zachariah and, and, uh, in, in Luke 1 and also Abraham. It's marriage that disciple children to fulfill the destiny of nations. It's a marriages that serve as instruments of redemption. Marriages that are vehicles for fulfilling life's assign assignments. Marriages that understand the times and the prophetic agenda of God, especially as far as Israel is concerned. That's why I'm actually happy that we've got these friends of ours, the Mayolas. They've got a heart for Israel. This is another twin of mine that I've known for over 30 years, Pagaman Botat. They, they have got a heart for Israel because it's important to have a revelation of the heart of God for Israel. We hear so much, especially politically, that this and that. But if you're a supernatural marriage, you can sit down. I say you are like a giraffe. A giraffe has got strong feet on the ground and a neck and a head that's high up there. They hear the voice of the master in spite of what is happening. They've, they've got their feet on the ground, but they hear the voice of God about anything. Not what the politicians say, not what people say, but what is the heart of God about the situation. So these are marriages that God is looking for. God is not going to come down, but he's going to use us to evangelize, going to, going to use us the families, to turn the tides. As my husband just said, the problem in society is not so much the politics, but it's the people who are in the politics. Because if the, far, if the home is fine, they will take that heaven to, to, to parliament. But the problem is the homes are not fine. And God is trusting the church because it's only the church who've got a mandate. It's the, only the church who's got a blueprint. It's only the church that's got the power. It doesn't help us to criticize people who have no revelation. It is up to us, says, Lord, change us. Help us to be the change agents. Let me be the type of woman. Let me be the type of wife that can be a blessing. Let me be the, if you are a man, let me be the type of husband that makes a woman easy for that woman to submit to you. Fortunately, I've got a, a husband that makes it easy for me to obey God because he makes it easy for me to submit to him. Amen. So I'm praying for you fathers that it's Mother's Day, but may you, fathers, be so godly. May you, fathers, so love your husbands. May you be such loving leaders that it makes you easy for your wives to submit to you. It will not help to say this woman is rebellious. Why is a woman rebellious? A woman who's loved, a woman who's cherished, a woman who's valued and respected is unable 
to be rebellious, unable. The, my, these are marriages, again, that combine the prophetic and the apostolic. Especially Priscilla and Aquila. I actually love Priscilla and Aquila because they were partners. And I, Aquila, I hear Aquila in Latin, it means eagle. And eagles, they say they mate for, for life. They have only one partner, not many partners. Hallelujah. Amen. And eagles, they fly above storms. So I like Priscilla and Aquila. When I think about the grace of that couple, it always motivates me. And they are also used by God. They were used by God even to correct something in the church. They were used by God to correct Apollos, you remember, because they had a connection with God. These are the marriages that husband the coming revival, revival through prophetic intercession. These are the marriages that are exceptions to the rule, breaking protocol. Like Deborah, Deborah broke protocol because traditionally, especially in the Jewish race, Jewish nation, the women didn't take leadership. But with Deborah, because of the calling on God's life, broke protocol and brought peace in the land. She didn't arise, the Bible says Deborah arose as a mother didn't arise as a rebellious mother like Jezebel, but arose as a godly mother. And as a result, there was peace. And also Priscilla and Aquila, again, they broke protocol. Priscilla seems to be the one who was more active. Also, yesterday, we watched another one, the royal wedding. This one, there was a breaking of protocol. It's never happened in the, Blit in the British... <laughs> uh, monarchy, that a woman from a mixed race, I mean, could be and treated like that. That one, that marriage is actually not an ordinary marriage. And I'm sure that woman, when she was accepting, she was thinking, it's like I'm an Esther. I'm not coming here just for the palace but I'm coming for destiny. And one of the things that blessed me about this woman, they say the, 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 the tray that she was wearing, it had all the, the flowers of the nations of the Commonwealth. So in her mind, I think she was thinking, this is not about me being a queen or a princess, it's about the nations. It's about the nations. And uh, I pray that we will pray. I don't know where she is spiritually. But when God has put a hand on a person, that thing is going to happen. So may we pray for this young lady, U U Megan, that the heart that he has for the nation, he's not impressed with the palace. You could see that he's, it's above the palace. It's about the nations. So may God really help. And we have that spirit as well, that we break protocol. We, we, we are like, it's not about me, but it's about the mandate and the call of God in my life. These are marriages also that are sacrificial offerings to God and others. They don't think for themselves. In fact, Galatians 2 verse 20, maybe we can read. Those are the people that say, I no longer live, but Christ the life that I live, I live by the Christ, the, by the grace of God who died for me. And among these ones, these marriages, I will mention a unique type of marriage that I will share in the second service. The unique type of marriage, this is somebody who is not married to a man or a woman. This is one that is married to God and God's purposes. If we read in Matthew 19, verse 5, it says there are people who are, were made eunuchs in their mother's womb. They were made eunuchs to just be for God. There are those who were made eunuchs by men. And there are those who have decided to be eunuchs 
for the kingdom of God. I say here, there are people who are married, but there are people who are married to God. If God has chosen you for a unique company, especially at these end times, don't want to get married. Hallelujah. Don't want to get married because if God has called you for a single life and is trusting you that in your singleness, you will be effective. We had Anna. Anna was a widow, was widowed after seven years, but didn't want to get married, but stayed in the house of the Lord and praying until Jesus came. There are a lot of people that God will not allow to marry. And my prayer is that we will not put pressure on people as if marriage is the only normal thing. God has called you for marriage. We thank Paul actually says, it's better for you not to get married. Because if you marry, you have to look for these things. Whereas if you're not married, you, your heart is single. Your heart is for the things of God. Especially now, we are living in the last days. We can't afford to see. In fact, there's a scripture that says, that day will come suddenly. Woe to those ones who are still breastfeeding. The trumpet. Amen. Amen. So let's accept, you know, First Corinthians 7. I will not read because I'm looking at the time. I've got lots of things that I wrote here. First Corinthians 7, it actually says, remain in that condition when God called you. If you are married, do not want to be unmarried. They want, they were married. Go good. Ah, and some fun is stay. Ketile, ketile. Ketile, ketile. Now, if you are unmarried, if God wants you to give you a spouse, God will tell you. But if God trusts you, that in your singleness, you will live for him. Please don't want to get married. These are supernatural families. Just want to, this, the next slide. Can you put the next slide? It's nice to, to actually see some things. The, the, the God's order, I like that slide. Because it shows the biblical order of a family. Of a normal family, of an exemplary family, and also a supernatural family. The important thing is the order. If there is no order, there is chaos. Amen. Christ must be above the husband. We've got a problem if Christ is not there. We find that in place of Christ, there is self, there's ego, there's a man who only knows himself. Or, if it's not self, it's ancestors. Not Amen. Not down, but. So Christ, and then the husband is there. The husband is there to protect the family. The husband is there to lead the family. The husband there is there to provide the family. If a husband is not in a position, he makes the wife very vulnerable. Vulnerable to disobedience, vulnerable to attacks, and vulnerable to rebellion because the man is not in position. So I beg on this day, you know, actually this is the day they say, it's the day of Pentecost, isn't it? Yes, where there's extra grace, where there's extra um, pouring of the Holy Spirit, I pray that God will put us in the right order. Amen. Amen. And then the wife is there to comfort. The wife is there to teach. The wife is there to nurture. 
especially the teaching part. This one is actually especially nowadays because, you know, during our time, there were no opposing forces so much. We actually looked at our parents and then we imitated them. But now, there's so many things. When we grew up, there was no television. You know, we knew gramophone. You know gramophone? When we ask our children, they don't know what that is. But there's television. And television is a bad teacher. And as a mother, that's why it's important to be sacrificial. Don't say, no, I want to, 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 to specialize. I want to get this and this. If you've chosen to be a mother, you must embrace the responsibilities of a mother. Because you've got to be there to teach your children. You've got to be there to observe what are they watching. It's amazing the amount of damage that's done by television. I've been just to a conference of the World Needs a Father in, in March, which I'm going to share some time when, when Mama Morin gives us time. But the effect of technology on the children's minds, that even looking at these changing pictures, it actually affects the brain cells. It affects the child. Besides looking at pornography, before we get to that one, just a child also looking at pictures, even comics, because people think that oh, if children are looking at comics, it's not a problem. In fact, it is. But we'll have time to talk about that. But as mothers, you've got to teach your children the word of God. As mothers, you've got to be there to protect the minds of the little ones. Because the brain, especially the first six months, six, three, three, month, three years, it's like a sponge. It absorbs everything in the environment. So as a mother, please nurture, comfort, and teach. And then the children would be uh, obedient. If children are rebellious. People are crying. Why are children rebellious? Who is teaching them? Who is leading your family? Those are the two questions I'm leaving with the church today. Can you have the next slide? I actually like that slide, not because I'm married to a gynecologist, I'm a man, <clears throat> but it speaks so much. On top there, I've got genes, I've got environment, I've got choices. I've got a woman there who is smoking, and I've written there, smoke represents stress in the family, represents the occult of false gods, represents anger in the family represents fear in the family, represents oppression, represents anything that is negative. So a pregnant mother is inhaling all that. If there's anger, that anger is going to the first generation, the mother herself. It's going to the second generation, the fetus, the baby. It's going to the third generation, the reproductive cells in the baby. So that's why the Bible says the, the son, the sins of the fathers are going to go to, from the first, second, third, and fourth generation. The first generation is the outside one that's causing those that smoke. Then next, the mother, then the fetus, then the reproductive cells. So if there's anger, those reproductive cells are absorbing anger. Those reproductive cells are absorbing fear. Those reproductive cells are, are absorbing the occult and the false gods. So it's important as a mother to know that the environment has a voice. What environment is there in your home? Is it an environment of occult or is it an environment of God and his love? Because it's not going to affect you. It's going to affect not only your child, but the next generation. So may God help us to be wise women, especially when we are pregnant, knowing that we are going to affect the next generation. God's order is important. Your environment is important. But the important thing is your choices. It's your choices. Because we know in the scripture that people 
who came from bad genes like Rahab and Ruth. An environment that was wrong, like Abraham and Sarah, they had to leave that environment. But because they made a choice for God, God was able to overrule the effect of the bad genes. Was, God was able to overrule the effect of the environment because you've made a choice. Today, may you make a choice for God. And stop blaming your parents. Stop blaming the government. Stop blaming other people. You've got a choice. God has given you choice. You can choose, your, you can choose in spite of everything. There are things in the Bible as well. You've got lots of examples. As I say, if you just look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ, at Rahab, where did Rahab come from? But Rahab made a choice. Tamar, what did Tamar do? But Tamar made a choice. But Sheba, I can start hitting guy. But, <clears throat> but, but Sheba made a choice. And the funny thing is because but Sheba made a choice, God actually used but Sheba to birth both the paternal side of our Lord Jesus Christ through Solomon and the maternal side through Nathan. Both Bathsheba's children are the four grand forefathers of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of choice. Doesn't matter where you come from, what choices are you making? You've made mistakes in life, but today you choose. You choose the right thing, amen. The important thing again is unity in the home. God will not bless where there is no unity. Love Psalm 133 that says, if you are united, God commands a blessing. You know, we ask, Lord bless me, God looks at unity. And I cannot bless these ones. There's no unity. Whereas there's unity, you don't even ask for a blessing. The Bible says he commands. God commands. May we be united in our families. May we be united in this supernatural family. Because if we are united in this supernatural family of the church, God will command a blessing. Amen. Mama, of course, okay. Sins of God. I just want to bring also, can you just get the next slide? Here we have got it's we've got types of people. That's a non-Christian. That is self on the throne. Jesus Christ is outside. Jesus Christ is outside of this life. And self is on the throne. That's not so much a problem because you know, and that one just needs to, to receive Jesus Christ and the Savior. The second one, this is the most difficult one because he's accepted Christ. Christ is inside the person, but with lapis to essence, who's on top? Self. He's controlling. Jesus is inside, but self is on the throne. May God help us because you can never have a supernatural marriage when there is self on the throne. It's got to be the Lordship of Christ. Supernatural marriage, Christ must be Lord of your life and Lord of your marriage. And then there won't be any jealousies. There won't be any worries. There won't be anything negative because God is on the throne. The next one. This is a spirit-filled Christian. This is who we are supposed to be. Let's dethrone self. Let's put Christ back on the throne. There is a scripture that I'd like to read, uh, Romans 12, especially today. This time, this church is talking about, about transformation. We've got to be transformed. I'd like to read Romans 12, especially from the message, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Can you put it on the screen, please? No, from the message, not NIV, please. You haven't got message from the message. 
Oh, no, it doesn't matter. I'm just worried about time. But it actually say, it's, it's, it's in my, because this is not the message. But it actually say, do everything. He says, I beg you to renew your mind. Not to have the mind of the world. But I actually say is that don't go down to the level of your culture. The level of your culture, which it's immature principles. That's the thing that I wanted to, to read. Please read it at home. Read it from the message. And then you will see that God is asking us. He says, because of the mercies of God, I've given you grace. I've given you mercy. Don't stoop down to the level of your culture. I'm not saying only the black culture. All cultures are sinful. Don't stoop down to the level of the immaturity of your culture. Rise up to the level of God. Rise up to be a vessel of honor. God is expecting you to be a vessel of honor, not vessel of dishonor. The Bible talks about types of vessels. Vessels of dishonor, the vessels of honor, vessels of mercy, vessels of wrath. May you be a vessel of mercy, not a vessel of dishonor. And I want to just, as I close... How do we do it? The, something that the Lord gave me, a re-script if you write down. There's a script that has been written on your life. That script maybe was written by your parents, maybe by your teachers, maybe by your past boyfriend, maybe by your past girlfriend, maybe by your friend. It's a script that is dark. What script is written in your life? Today you re-script.